And we're ready to roll. Good luck, Steve. Thank you. Uh, I've got a meeting, so let's do the tourist uh, blessings real quick, and then I'm headed out. Baruch, I taught you all. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Share, can you stop? 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 Share, can you uh, during Torah study. We really, really would appreciate it. Thank you very much and have a great day. You you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, I want to wish everyone a meaningful Yom Kippur starting tonight. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, Wednesday. It is Wednesday. <laughs> it is Wednesday. The big day has arrived. Um, this is our last Torah study of the book of Deuteronomy, I believe. And then next week we have a special reading for that of, of, um, of um, um, Sukkot. And then we'll be starting the cycle all over again with a whole list of new readings. Um, I want to thank Riva Lit has spent many hours putting together a new schedule for next year. Um, it's a lot of work, thank you. And uh, yes, yeah, so she's really an organizational genius. And uh, so uh, we'll be circulating that schedule you know, soon. And if you're interested, let her know and you can take a look at it. There may it's be not the stuff. same cycle, huh? It's we're we're picking we pick we try to pick all different subjects right so um, you know every every uh, week in fields has at least two and sometimes three and four uh, topics so we tried to deal with a completely different set of things but if you see one that's a repeat you can point it out to Reva myself and Steve and we will zap it and and switch it to something brand new. Uh, okay, so today we may end a little earlier in, in, uh, uh, in honor of Yom Kippur, um, and we have a very, uh, a, a very long topic today, if God's ways are just, what about evil? <laughs> now, um, we are definitely going to resolve this once and for all today. Minya has been, Minya has been talking about this for months. And so today we're going to, to fix the topic and we'll, we'll come up with a complete and total resolution uh, about the question of evil in the world. No, I'm just joking. Uh, this is not something that it's possible to resolve. Um, and, and that's a good thing. You know, um, Judaism's idea is to get us thinking about important issues in the world and in our lives not to not to come up with a series of pat answers. So there, there are some questions that are unanswerable, but that doesn't mean they're unaskable. And that's, uh, that's the best I can do at this point. Um, but we are gonna look at it today and uh, uh, maybe we'll come up with some insights. Does that sound okay, Minya? I think she's frozen. Um, okay. Um, um, who, um, I also, before we start, want to point out that we, uh, the Adult Education Committee is going to start a course um, in October on the Book of Noah that I'm teaching. And so uh, the, the, the goal is to pitch that at a somewhat higher level than this, uh, which means that we'll be looking more detail of the story of Noah and the Ark and the rainbow and the animals and that very um, scandalous event that occurs after the flood where something happens with Noah and we'll find out, you know, we'll try to discover what that is. Uh, oh, Lily, Minnie, you have a friend. Okay. 
Um, page 178, who'd like to start reading? Uh, good morning, Nan. Good morning, Lorraine. Good morning, good morning Ray. Rabbi, can I ask a question before we start? Sure. Why is this the one and only time that there's a poem? No, there's biblical poetry throughout the Torah and the Tanakh. Um, James Kugel, who I did a course on a number of uh, like a year and a half ago, he has a whole book, The Great Poems of the Bible. Um, so there are other poems in, in the Torah and in the Tanakh. And many of the poems presumably are very old, but not always. Lorraine, you have to adjust your camera. Oh, yes, you're right. Rabbi. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to mute people and then you unmute as you need to. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, um, uh, Pam, does that answer your question? I have another question. Sort of. I asked if Moses, if this is Moses' only poem. Hmm. I don't think so, but I'd have, I, I don't know. Okay. You've inspired me. I will research. Rabbi? Uh, uh, Marsha. It, I remember a few years ago when we had uh, Simcha's Torah and we, this was before you came and we had undone the whole Torah all around the congregation. And there was one section that looked unusual because it wasn't writing, writing, writing. It was, you know, uh, <laughs> aligned. <Yeah. Right. laughs> is this the poem that, is that a line poem there at that point? It, yes, that? yes. Uh -huh. and, and so the Torah wrote this poem in a, in a very uh, distinctive way. So it looks like a poem. And so when you unroll the Torah, immediately you can see that. You don't right. have to wait to unroll the Torah. You can go on the internet and find a, a picture of the Torah itself and you can see it the same way. It was, it was so distinctive, you know, it's so different from that one section, you know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other comments or questions so far? Okay. Um, then who'd like to read page 178 on the left? Yeah, I'll do it if you want. Okay. Okay, Perak Aleph, if God's ways are just, what about evil? Moses stands before the people of Israel as an old man. He has led them for 40 years. He has been their liberator and their teacher. Now he is about to die. The people will follow Joshua, his successor, into the land of Israel. One can imagine Moses' agony as he ponders the question, what shall be my final message to my people? The Torah presents his answer in a powerful poem. It begins with the plea that his thoughts be heard. Give ear, O heavens, let me speak. Let the earth hear the words I utter. May my discourse come down as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like showers on young growth, like droplets on the grass, for the same of, name of Adonai, I proclaim, give glory unto our God. Moses continues his poem, offering within it his understanding of God. His words are carefully chosen. They portray God in a number of significant ways. He tells the people, the rock, God's deeds are perfect. Yes, all God ways are just. A faithful God never falls. True and upright is God. God is the source who created you, fashioned you and made you endure. God wounds and heals. Those who reject God will be punished. Those who... Uh, I think that bad froze. Important questions. What does Moses mean when he calls God perfect, just, faithful, true, 
and upright. Can God be just and faithful and wound and heal at the same time? Can How can we understand God's justice? Okay, thank you, Babette. So first comment that I'd like to make is that today we look at God in a multitude of ways. And so we're not bound by the image of God in the book of Deuteronomy or anywhere else. That's number one. However, now we're just trying to see what is the book of Deuteronomy, at least in this part, uh, trying to say about God. And obviously God is a complex personality that has both positive and negative attributes. Any comments about the question, responses to the question, can God be just and faithful and also wound and heal at the same time? Any responses to that? Ray? Hey. Did you say Ray? Yep, I said Ray. Would you like to give a stab at this? Uh, you're uh, our senior theologian. We're going to pin up uh, business cards with your title. Um, so thank you. thank you. That will be a great honor that I cannot meet. <laughs> um, I have been reading. Uh, an interrupted um, life. It was two volumes closely written, um, a journal by a Dutch woman, 27 years old. And uh, she is waiting in Holland uh, uh, to, she knows that she's going to the work of places and she is as <clears throat> discombobulated as any of us would be, but she has not been called yet. However, she sees this person, that person uh, going and she doesn't see them again and she has great fear. And she goes to a class by, uh, uh, run by a man, 52 years old. A, uh, and this is the time of Jung, J-U-N-G, the uh, psychologist. And what this man is trying to do is to help these people go inside themselves and find their best self inside. Don't concentrate on the bad. Concentrate on the good. And this, it's, it's over a period of two years. This is a very hard thing to do. She finds God inside herself. When she is finally sent to the first um, concentration camp, She's trying very hard to help those around her listen to their insides where they can find God. The conclusion, as I read it, uh, and it tends to be part of this Parsha, is that all of us have God inside of us. And all of us have evil inside of us. Remember, I, I said that my mother told me that when I was born, this little mark above my mouth, so the angel struck me there and told me I could choose um, right or wrong. And this is a terrible thing for each of us, a, 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 a terrible responsibility. Um, I have a feeling that um, a God it, it cannot fight the evil that we meet, uh, that we have to fight it with God. And I can't think of any other way of expressing this parashat. Okay. Any, it is a help. 
Any other responses to Ray or to the question itself? Bernie or Pam or Lorraine? Uh, Reva. Yeah, I think throughout this Parsha, you know, the question keeps coming up, you know, is God all powerful or are there limits on his power? You know, and what has to come within us and what comes from however we define God? You know, basically, I think the same thing that Ray is saying. And so there's evil in the world, but it's not necessarily generated directly by God. It's but very it, unclear. And on the other hand, we can't separate it. You know, then Harold Kushner's theology, you know, when bad things happen to good people, uh, bad is removed completely from God. And that's more of a dualistic perspective on the world, which was not, you know, not traditional Jewish thinking. Okay, anyone else? Sai, can oh, God be a bad I guy? The, the beauty, I think, of the religion, or at least one of the beauties, is the fact that we can have God do whatever we want him to do. We can make him good or we can make him bad. We can have him do all kinds of tricks or we can have him resting. It's whatever we have in our own heart and when our, with, within our own mind. So God is a reflection of our own consciousnesses. Exactly. Marsha, are you more with Ray or more with Sai? I think their views are quite different, actually. I agree with Sai, but I also agree with Ray that uh, huh. the responsibility is there for us, you know, and that, that's the important part. That she's yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I'm sort of agreeing with Sai. I, I, I kind of like the idea that we have the power to, you know, to, to determine this. Minya? Well, I always thought we were supposed to be created in God's image. So if that's true, then we have to figure that he also has a dual personality where there's good and evil if we were created the same way. So that would mean that we do have both and it's up to us, depending on how we live, to live our lives either with good or be influenced by evil. Marsha? Well, going back to thinking, you, you, you hit me fast with that one last time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, they say that there is no good without evil. So I think that we've got to, I think we have to explore that. I mean, there's always going to be evil, uh, whether we as individuals can keep that out of our lives, you know, that we should not be the producer of evil, that we should be, try to be on the good side of it all. Uh, but there's always going to be evil. There are people who don't consider, don't think about it, and they act evilly. And uh, not everyone is reflective about their choices. And uh, that's the downside of society, I guess. So people can do bad without even being aware I'm doing bad. Sai. Well, I think that we set the parameters as to what's good and what's evil. And that changes for different people at different times in their lives. Uh, Minya? And does that go back to the question that God represents good and that there is a devil that represents bad? Uh-huh. Um, if people think that. Is that an excuse then for doing evil deeds? The devil made me do it? No. It's not. What about the Ten Commandments? Does that, is that for everybody? Uh, okay. Ten Commandments were given to the Jews, so the seven <laughs> laws of Noah were given to everyone. So in Judaism, we would talk about the universal seven laws of Noah, but it's basically the same idea. The seven laws of Noah are, you know, be a, be a decent person. Christians don't have the Ten Commandments. Thou not shalt according. not steal, thou shalt not murder, right? Not according to the rabbinic thinking, the Ten Commandments were given to, to the Jews as part of the covenant. 
but something similar was given to everybody in the laws of Noah. So do not steal, for example, do not murder. Those were included the seven laws of Noah. So uh, which of the seven, uh, which of the 10 commandments are omitted in the seven laws of Noah? Well, they're, 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 um, they're different. Uh. The, the seven laws of Noah are more general. And they were the they were the uh, regulations that God gave to Noah after the flood. You know, we'll be going through that in that course. Not that I'm trying to advertise too much for that course, but that will be covered there. Um, but for our purposes, it's really the same thing. Uh, you know, all the things you would imagine that a normal person should not do: uh, do not kill, do not steal, do not, you know, do not cut the slash the tires of your neighbor, do not play loud rock music after midnight. Uh, all of these were included in Seven Laws of Noah. Okay, who'd like to read? Uh, Babette, you want to continue interpreters of Torah? Okay. Okay. Interpreters of Torah have constantly struggled with such questions. From ancient to modern times, human beings have asked in the midst of their pain and suffering, where is God? If God is perfect, why is the world that God created so imperfect? Why do people hurt one another? Why does a God of justice allow hunger, war, and disease? Why does God permit loving and generous human beings to be tortured by disease or cruelty or innocent children to be abused, starved, or killed? Can one really say that God's deeds are perfect, just, never false, true, and upright? These are good questions, you know? I mean, God created that too. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it, this is rephrasing questions that Minya has asked a number of times right. over the last few months and that, you know, I've kind of partially brushed aside because what am I supposed to say? And so here they're being asked in a very direct manner. And, uh, you know, we're going to at least try to, uh, but, but. You know, as you see, there's there's no good solution to these to these questions. Uh, um, anybody want to give a stab? Can we really say that God's deeds are perfect, just, never false, true, and upright? I mean, would anyone be willing to say that? Uh, Ray, Ray. I won't fight that God is all these things. But uh, somehow I keep thinking of the worst murders I've ever heard um, <clears throat> when I was much younger. Maybe uh, others among you might remember. Uh, remember the Philippine nurses who were um, murdered. Uh, there were a number of them. And the man raped each one after he killed them. That man was not well brought up at all. He did not know love. He did not know kindness. He should not have been born. Uh, by that, I mean, there was no one. His parents did not have the, the ability to teach him right or wrong. And that is true of many people. On the other hand, um, one of my sons has lived in Africa for many years. And what they have found among the tribes is great uh, uh, the living in their individual um, uh, homes away from the big city, these people are extremely happy, close to nature. Uh, <clears throat> they have a natural way of living. There are many unnatural ways of living throughout our world, especially the more developed ones. So what I am saying 
is God wants everything right, but there are people who have not been have not the strength or understanding of what is right or evil. A bad response. So another man who um, ate his his victims. What kind of upbringing do people have okay. that can do such horrendous things? Thank you, Ray. Babette, response? Well, getting back to perhaps Minya's experience and her point, well, the Nazis had religion. They were good Christians, right? They went to church. Well, partly and partly not. Yeah. Mostly not. And but, also but, during the Crusades, they were Christians, right? Right. Um, but uh, that's also complicated because it's not necessarily the people who planned the Crusades that did the bad stuff. Well, then you have the Inquisition. Yes, well, that there that's maybe a more direct example. Those people were directly presenting themselves as representing the true faith, and they were torturing people on behalf of the true faith. So that that's the best example of the three. Better than devout the Muslims, also my way or the highway, my Say, way or you're a dead person. What 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 was the example? Muslims, okay, oh. my way or. Some, so Muslims, some Muslims, yes. Real the, law. The Fundamentalists. The, the, the Taliban and this, you know, what's going on there. Yes, yeah, so so those two examples I like the best is the uh, Inquisition and the Taliban. Um, Riva? Yeah, I think there are no shortages of, of opportunities to observe or, or read or learn about bad behavior. There's plenty of it. Also, we know there's lots of suffering and certainly a substantial amount of it, although it's immeasurable, is, is you know, there really is. There's infants who die of horrible diseases, et cetera. There's people who live in poor countries who don't get clean water to drink or whatever and die of cholera. So I think there's no so shortage of suffering in the world. But I think where I find religion more helpful is how do we live our own lives? How do we conduct our own lives um, in the midst of this complex and painful world? And in that context, I find um, Judaism in particular can be very, very helpful. You know, how do we want to live our lives? How do we want to interact with other people? How, how do we want to support other people who are living their lives? And then I think the religion to me, at least I, I feel like I, I can access it a little easier. Okay, so on a personal basis, a religion can foster good easier than on a, a societal basis. When you take a religion and you say, mm -hmm. we're gonna apply this across our empire to 100 million people, then it can become a force for repression much more easily. Yeah. Um, but if it's just me, and I'm trying to live a good life, I can use religion in a more positive way. Uh, Lorraine, would you like to comment at this point? You have to unmute if you do. She's thinking about it, she's not sure. Okay, we can't hear you because you have to unmute because I muted you earlier. All right. Yes? Oh, Lorraine? I don't know the answer. Uh, it's just... You can argue both ways. Uh, each person that presented their view, if I just listened to that, it would make sense. But then if I weigh the other one, that one didn't make that much sense. So I don't know. OK, Minya and then Sai. I'm going to throw a wrench into this by saying, if we're the chosen people, why has there been anti-Semitism forever? I know there's a theory that says our numbers are supposed to be small yeah. or not question. get too big. Good question. But here's my question. Yes, and that's another one of these questions that 
I we hope can't Minya, Minya is not going to be disappointed <laughs> in me. Uh, <laughs> but, That's why uh, I said it was only a wrench. I didn't expect an answer. <laughs> Um, but let's keep that in mind over the next few minutes. Sai. Uh, I think it's interesting if you think back at the history of this country, when it was initially formed, the concept of religion was taken out of it. Uh, all the people who formed it were religious people, but they saw something in religion that they knew would not work. And so they tried to make a country uh, make it just, to make it legal, make it right, and then try to make it good without any kind of religion, just by having rules and regulations of liberty and justice for all. They pushed religion out of it. And, and I think that way people uh, can get involved a little bit better than just having a religion and basing what they feel is good or bad on their religion. And that's been, particularly for the Jews, one of the problems over, the, over time. Pam? Um, I think as Jews, we're encouraged to have a personal relationship with God. And having a personal relationship with God, we can determine, um, um, when we see evil, we can determine that uh, you know, we should do our best to make sure the evil doesn't proliferate. So, okay, I guess. I mean, I guess um, it depends what kind of personal relationship you successfully build with God. Um, but you know, I try to do that, but I don't think I could go to God and say. Like, you know, going back to Minya's uh, uh, challenge to, to us or to me, um, God, could you stop anti-Semitism? I, I don't think it would work. <laughs> and so, um, you know, yes, Pam and then Marsha. Yeah, but I don't think we're ask, we should ask God to stop anti-Semitism. We should see what we can do. Uh if we make that a priority for us to try to stop anti-Semitism in our own little local way, if, if possible. But yeah, I don't think it's having a personal relationship with God is not throwing these things back at God and saying, okay, take care of it. It's us finding a way to take care of it on our own personal level. Uh, Marsha and then Sai. So are we talking about our personal relationship with good and evil or with God? Are we talking about the chosen people's relationship with this 0.001% probably of the world being Jewish? I don't know what the exact percent is. That we're, we're, we cannot be the monitors of good and bad. Uh, so I'm thinking it, you know, what the Torah is taught, speaking to us about is our personal level of good and bad. And otherwise, it get, it becomes unwieldy, <laughs> so to say, of uh, a small group of people like us. Uh, and how many people in amongst those people, a small percent of the small percent that are even aware thinking about good and evil. You know, it's uh, most people aren't going around saying, "Oh, I'm doing the good thing today." They just act, you know, on how they're going to be acting. You know, and so it's a personal thing. Uh -huh. Now, um, you're going to see in the next couple of paragraphs certain, certain values, certain traits. Uh, um, that are um, considered very important in, in how we look at God. And those traits include justice and uh, mercy and love in a divine sense. So now you'll, 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 if you compare our services tonight and tomorrow with the you know, more traditional liturgy, you'll see that the more traditional liturgy mentions some of God's traits much more. But since 
Our calculation is that most people don't understand these traits in a deep way, that not having studied them, that just talking about, you know, something like what Psalms say or what Isaiah says in this next paragraph wouldn't be meaningful for them. So we kind of um, keep the liturgy, the things we say simpler. So it's things that people can relate to. But if we did study these things and we did understand these character traits of God, then it might be more meaningful to put them back into the liturgy. And so, so let's read a little bit more. Babette, do you want to read a little more? And then we'll turn it over to someone else after okay. the next uh, two or three paragraphs. Okay. Despite the anguish they have experienced, many Jews, like the prophet Isaiah, maintain that faith expressed by Moses, that Adonai is a God of justice. In his time, the psalmist articulates the same determination. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. For centuries, even in the darkest times of persecutions, many Jews have declared their faith at the ultimate justice of God. Others go even further. For them, God's justice is tempered with the equally power, powerful claim of God's mercy and love. They too base their views on Moses' experience and testimony within the Torah. Just before receiving the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, Moses experiences and defines God as compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, rich in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness due to, to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgressions and sin. Reflecting this view of God on the psalmists, comments that the earth, Adonai, is full of your mercy, underscoring the conviction that while God may judge the world and all its creatures and even punish them for their sins, God also cares for them and loves them. Rabbinic commentators teach that God's power for justice, Mindinat Hadem, and power for mercy, Mindinat HaRashamim, are always combined. Without their interconnection, the rabbis argue the world cannot endure. It will be out of balance and incomplete, resulting in destruction only by simultaneously exercising justice and mercy, say the rabbis, can God create and sustain the world. Mercy or justice alone is insufficient. Okay, thanks for that. So this is a very different question than what Minya was asking earlier, both this morning and in earlier weeks. This is now saying that God kind of balances um, uh, what they call Midat din and Midat HaRachamim. Midat din is the uh, importance of justice, which is kind of strict, and Midat HaRachamim, the characteristic of, of, um, of um, well, they translate it as mercy, but let me see if I can come up with a better word here. Rachamim is, um, uh, what do you call it? Like when Pity. The, Say again. Pity. Compassion. When, when the, uh, when the um, uh, policeman stops you for speeding and he just kind of gives you a warning rather than gives you a ticket because he's nice. This only happens to women, but it's still, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's true. It's true. Um, but, um, um, this balance between strictness and uh, thoughtfulness, a little bit of giving a little bit of, of uh, uh, 
extra thoughtfulness. Uh, th this is what the sages of the Talmud constantly go back to, you know, so this is not about good and evil. This is more about strictness and laxity or strictness and mercy. So it's a, a little bit of a different, it, it's a different question. Um, any comments on this right now, Pam or Minya? Minya? I think the key then is the word that we read, which is faith. If you have faith in God, whether it's in a personal relationship or you just believe that God is in control of what happens in the world, I think it's faith. So with faith, then all these other things become acceptable, whether it's mercy or justice or any of the other words. I think the key word is faith. Okay. And faith in Hebrew could be emuna, trans, uh, translate emuna. Uh, Pam or Marsha? Can you, can you repeat that word again, Rabbi? What, what's the faith? What's faith in Hebrew? Emuna. Emuna. I think that's what I said, right? Yeah. Uh, Sai. I'm wondering why should the citizens of the United States have the same degree of justice and liberty as they would in God having <laughs> justice and liberty? Uh, to me, it's pretty much the same thing. If you are a just person and you believe in liberty, you're doing everything that's right. You don't, for me, you don't have to pursue after God. Do what the country asks you to do. That's the way we should live our lives, I think. Um, and, and of course, there, you know, anything we talk about in religious terms we could talk about in secular terms as well. So there's, you know, parallel systems that are very similar. So you could have systems of secular ethics that are really almost identical to religious ethics. Exactly. So in the end, it's just as as you pointed out, Sai, it's more, you know, what kind of of uh, of of, of uh, symbolic construct you want to build. Uh, to to to, uh, to house your ethical system, or to house your explanation of what's the meaning of life, and in the end, it's pretty similar. It can be pretty similar. It doesn't have to be. Marsha, wait. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking, if God wanted us all to be good, He would have made us all good. So coming out of the Garden of Eden, which we went, Rabbi and our little group who did the presentation to Sisterhood beats a death, <laughs> we really went into that. At that point, God gave us a choice of good and evil and whatever we wanted to learn, do or learn. So through the centuries, evil has been there for men and it's a choice that each person has to make, each country has to make uh, as a group. Um, so I... I don't see, but I, you, the secular and the religious are similar because they're basically following the same rules, even if we don't say so. And, um, uh, but if you look as the 10 commandments are gonna be in all our laws and all, in countries all over the world, not just the United States. And uh, it's just a matter of each person's dedication to being good and not evil and and you know as people as parents as we you know procreate and we bring up children we bring them up to be good to generation generationally go forward with goodness we can't help it when there are people who are um uh and you know and ethical of uh or um beliefs of good and and i would imagine when it comes down to it with the muslims i mean they think they're right that their good is good i mean it's, it's a matter of belief a lot, to each society when it comes down to that well then that you get into question of relativism you know it, it, if i if 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 i and jennifer and bernie if the three of us sit down and we develop a system uh, that we say is right does that make it right 
And and the answer I was like, is you believe it's right. Well, and we the three of us believe it's right as individuals, and the three of us as a group believe it's right, but that doesn't necessarily make it right. There has to be a, a, an encounter with with a certain external criteria to determine if it's right. Otherwise, you have a completely relativistic system. And I was amazed. I was part of this rabbinic fellowship a number of years ago. And I was amazed how they were peddling this idea of relativism or something that came very close to it. Everybody, you know, believes what they believe and we should always accept it. And, and there's no objective truth. Uh, and, and it sounds nice because then you can ex you know, be inclusive, which is an important value in American society. And I, I want to be inclusive too. But there are certain things that are true and certain things that are not. We have to determine that, and that requires the use of the Greek philosophers and others. Uh, but there is a sense of that, that rationality must prevail, and you need to use logic and other science, tools of scientific inquiry to determine something true or not to true. And you see that today with the anti-vaxxers who believe whatever whatever they believe and they say if i believe it then that's my belief you can't question my belief but yes you can question beliefs so that's that's you know i think you have to be very careful about relativism um pam but every organized religion has to have some parameters that they base on and, and and you can't just say, oh, you can believe anything you want and be part of this organized religion. There's gotta have some basis or, right. we, what, or we don't mean anything. Right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's a, a problem in modern society that, um, and I see this not only with Judaism, but with some of the Christian groups that they are so inclusive that they accept anybody believing anything. And then you aren't, you don't, not only is it not really a religion anymore, it, it doesn't stand for anything. And you can admit people with views that are simply wrong. And if something is wrong, there, there has to be a methodology for determining whether something is just outright wrong. All right, now we're gonna skip a few paragraphs, um, but basically it goes into the idea of Hillel and weighing the scale of judgment toward the, um, the scale of mercy rather than justice, right? And then Fields asks the questions, how do we account for the suffering of good people? So let's go down to the very bottom of 179 on the left. How do we account for the suffering of good people? And you're going to see that they're going to talk about God as Diane had met, the judge of truth. And we'll see if that resonates at all with us thousands of years later. Who, um, Babette, I guess we'll let you continue being our honorary reader. Well, I'm not honorary, but when I'm, I'm on 179, where am I finding this? Very story? bottom paragraph on the left, early rabbinic commentators. Very bottom of the left hand column. No? I fell asleep. <laughs> no, I'm not asleep at all. I'm on 179. One is concepts of God, the other is with the belief in mind. It is the faith of God's ultimate justice. Are you sure you're on page 179? That's what it says. Very bottom, bottom of the like first that. column, Babette. The first column, not the second. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was looking the wrong side. Early rabbinic commentators commonly answered these questions by claiming that while righteous human beings may suffer in the world, they will be rewarded by God in the olam ha haba or the world to come. 
Pain is the in this world is temporary and brief. The righteous may suffer at the hands of cruel human beings or in the case of illness or disease because of the inability of human beings to find a cure. Such pain is identified by the rabbis as yasirim shel ha'ava or the suffering of love and God, the dayan ha'amet or the judge of truth rewards those who endure the, 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 these sufferings with mercy forever in the olam haba. All right, and this is the, one of the traditional answers to Minya's question. Um, so uh, to summarize it, it what, why do good people suffer? One explanation is that uh, this may be an unfortunate result of of circumstance, but that, that some good people may suffer at the hands of mean people, or so, some people may suffer at the hands of cruel diseases. But either way, um, this is unfortunate, but God will make it up to those people in the coming world. And that sounds a little bit Christian, what we what we would associate with Christianity, but of course it's not. It's it's a very uh, Judaic concept. But is it a concept that we can relate to that we find meaningful and uh, helpful? Um, uh, does everybody understand the the idea? Rabbi, are you talking about resurrection? No, Alama, but well. No, Alam Abba, well, it's not said. Alam Abba literally means the world to come. And the rabbis don't really define it. The way I would understand that would be like what we would call heaven. <clears throat> but, but, you know, but size raising an interesting point. We don't know what this Alam Abba is. It could be resurrection. Certainly some of the mystics believed that you know, we would be resurrected into a new life. And maybe, you know, if you suffer in this life, God owes you and will bring you, if you have a, a terrible arthritis for many years, you'll be rewarded by having a very limber and healthy body into your 120th year. Ne next time around, uh, maybe, you know. <laughs> And now I don't know if you have a limber and athletic body into your 120th year this time, whether you'll be, you know, given a, a arthritic body next time, just because, you know, the, all the athletic bodies have to be given to the people that suffered last time. I don't, I don't know. Um, comments, responses to this idea. Minya, does this, does this, even partially satisfy you? No, I was going to say that this goes back to what I said about faith. There's no scientific basis that there is a world to come afterwards. And we have no way of knowing other than faith. So if we have a strong belief in God and we hear that whatever happens on, whatever you do on earth will give you a better life in the world to come, then that's your faith in God and your belief that that could happen. But I, I would say that I personally believe in God, but I'm not convinced that I'm going to have a world to come. I'm not counting on it. I mean, if it happens, it happens, but I'm not counting on it. So I don't necessarily think that one goes with the other that you can, you, you, if you believe in God, you necessarily believe in a world to come. But if, if, if there is a world to come, and God sort of promises good people will be compensated. I guess that is some uh, uh, compensation for suffering in this world. Certainly, it's very hard to see very good people um, who are suffering very much. Well, especially children. I always wonder when I watch the St. Jude's commercials why so many children have to suffer. But on the other hand, is it written somewhere? that says, if you do all of these things, don't worry, you're gonna be repaid later. 
Well, the Talmud in Tanit says that, yes. Okay. That, uh, that, uh, um, that Baruch Dayan Hamet, blessed is God, who is the judge of truth, meaning that everything will be, you know, evened out in the end. Um, Marsha. This, this sounds very Christian. Now, did the Christians take this from this portion or was that previous to that? I mean, I don't know what was written first, you know. Yeah, I don't either. And this is, a, this is in the Talmud. So early Christianity developed at the same time as rabbinic Judaism. So it appears that both developed the same time. Uh, um, they're both basing themselves on certain biblical ideas and certain, you know, ideas of Israelite religion. I wouldn't, I, I, I don't have any reason to think that the uh, Christians borrowed it from rabbinic Jews, although they obviously borrowed it from the earlier Jewish thinking. But, uh, but the Christian view is much better known, right? If you, you suffer in this world and you're compensated in the next world, but uh, rabbinic Judaism appears to have a very similar concept. I'm not, I'm sure there's some subtle differences. Uh, Bernie, uh, Bernie, and then back to Marsha. Uh, unmute, Bernie. I had done that, sorry. Um, how does Judaism relate to the gospel according to Maud, which says God will get you for that, Walter? Uh, say it again. <laughs> uh, how does Judaism relate to the comment that, that is attributed to Maud on her TV show years ago that said, God will get you for that, Walter? <laughs> uh, um, well, it's the opposite. Uh, it's, it's the opposite of what we've been talking about. That, that, that if you do something bad, God will punish you. Right. That's a I, mean, I, guess, I mean, I guess we have to watch the um, Coen Brothers movie, A Serious Man, uh, which is, uh, in my view, a classic uh, uh, a film of Jewish theology. Um, and that that deals exactly with that with that question. If you do something, what if you do something that you know is wrong for a good cause? So. The, the, the protagonist in that movie does something um, uh, that, that he knows is not ethical, but to, for very altruistic reasons, to help someone else. No benefit to himself whatsoever. Uh, and uh, would God punish you for something like that? And uh, I won't give away the movie. Has anyone seen A Serious Man? Okay. Long so, time ago. <laughs> um, yeah, but what about... You know, that, that again, getting back to these, let's say, Muslims who want every Jew on the planet dead, yet when they need medical help, they're in Hadassah Hospital getting medical help, them and their children, and then when they go back to their village, they're going, going back to their previous ways. Well, um... <laughs> okay okay yeah it's not okay there's no rationale <laughs> response to babette bernie pam marcia it does it's it's not rational um they you know they'll take what they can get from the jews and they're gonna punish them other you know in their you know otherwise it's it there's no reasoning for that and that, uh, I mean, I don't think that it even implies into our conversation with the good and evil. It's their belief. That's what I was saying. They think they're right. And so anything they do is going to be right that, to them. Okay. Bernie. I mean, Bernie and then Reva. I think this is, that Babette's comments are a bit harsh. I think the vast majority of the Muslims are like we are. They just want to get on with their lives and... That's it. They don't. They, they don't wake up every morning and say, "I want to kill all the Jews." Well, they're the schooling them at a very early age. Like we play cowboys and Indians, they play Muslims and Jews. Um, 
So I guess that let's uh, reformulate the question for those who are filled with hate of whatever background, uh, how do you how do you deal with such a person? And I guess, I mean, as Marsha said, if they really believe it, and uh, if, if they've been brainwashed in this way, there's not much you can do. Um, but they could, you know, um, I mean, look at the 9-11 hijackers. They presumably believed somehow they were doing something good, that, you know, America as a country is an evil empire that's repressing their peoples. And if they can damage America, that will help their peoples, I guess. But Ilian Omar said in public, some people did something. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm trying to, I bet I'm trying to steal career of anything Sorry. that could be regarded <laughs> as politics. So we're going to move on. Uh, Riva and then Ray. Yeah, two, two hopefully quick comments. Um, one is, um, I lived among many Muslims years ago in India, and I, among them I found many really fine people. Um, I think there are many paths to the divine, and there are also paths to the opposite direction. So I just want to, that's all I want to say about that. But I think one of the things that is, interests me in this discussion, or in this Parsha, is what is and I think all of us have experienced death very, very, very close at hand for people we cared about a great deal. And, and the question that comes up for me is, is there anything of the essence of that person that lives beyond their life? You know, I think an easy answer is certainly some of the essence of our ancestors lives on in us and lives on our, in our children and our families. But that's just a piece of it. You know, is there anything else? We, we've known some wonderful people who are just so unique and so special and so beautiful. Is there any essence of them that lives beyond this world? And I think we have no answers to that. And how does that tie into the question about good and evil? So we've talked, now we're moving this discussion a little bit into the future world, uh, what happens after death. How, Reva, how would you tie that into the, early, the, the, the central question we're asking today? Um, what is that, Matt, what impact does that have on this, I, this discussion of evil? I think it addresses the piece that covers, you know, that we'll get, there's some kind of payoff in the afterworld, which I have a lot of trouble with. You know, is there an afterworld? Um, is, there, is, there, is there some kind of reward for suffering? Um, I, I can't go there. Well, let me ask how many people raise your hand, believe there's an afterworld in which we'll have a conscious existence. So we'll die and then we wake up in heaven and uh, um, an angel will say, I'll show you to your new house. And there's the buffet and that sort of thing. How many believe there's a, that you'll have a conscious existence after you die? Not a single person. And okay, well, then I won't ask any other questions because the, all right, Pam. I, I like the expression, and especially when you say it, Rabbi from the Bima, when we do like yard site and you say, may their memory be a blessing. To me, that's, that's, that sums it up for me. May their memory be a blessing, so. Yeah, so, um, and that's, you know, very different than saying that that person is enjoying a buffet up in heaven. Right. So, um, um, you know, so, but, but they would be nice if we, if we, if we could have an afterlife that was a real life, you know, forever in a peaceful, I mean, I would think that I would like a heaven that's sort of a little like Arizona, but more water and cooler temperatures in the summer. Yeah, but I um, feel like I don't need an afterlife. If my memory is a <laughs> to my children, I, 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 I'm, I'm one. <laughs> okay. You don't need an afterlife. Okay. Asai. 
you think if you ask an Orthodox congregation the same question, you'd get the same answer? I don't think so, but it depends. I mean, a lot of my Orthodox friends or acquaintances are these Orthodox intellectuals who really believe exactly the same thing we do, but they like the Orthodox practices and they know how to talk the lingo. So they're kind of like my mom, they're playing, you know, they're playing both ends, you know, so they're, they're completely rational like we are, but they, they like the Orthodox lifestyle, but a real Orthodox Jew who believes in the Orthodox Orthodox thinking is going to believe that there's an afterlife in which you have, um, but not all, but not all Orthodox uh, Jews believe that that afterlife means you'll have a a, a, a scent. Uh, what's the word uh, when you have a consciousness that you will have sent you you'll be uh, a sentient sentient being after death that. Um, uh, certainly someone like Maimonides believed that your soul is purified through philosophic inquiry and that after death your soul is reunited with God, but that soul is not, you know, it's not a Dana or a Jennifer or uh, a Riva, it's, it's divine material. And when you're reunited with God, that that's what's important and it's not, you know, that you'll be sigh up there saying, I miss Sun City Grand a little bit. You'll, it, it'll just be your soul, which is whatever it is. It's imp from God's point of view, that's what's important, but you won't have a conscious recognition of your previous life. So, okay, Marsha. I think that if you're good, because a good person because you're waiting to get a reward a bribe that that's it's not right <laughs> it's contraindicated you should be good for the purpose of being for the idea of being good sadaka is supposed to be the pure sadaka is when you get no thanks for the or you do it anonymously so you're not known, you just do it because it's the right thing to do. Doing good in general should be the same thing. You shouldn't be waiting for the rule, you know, the lollipop at the end of the, you know, the doctor visit or whatever. You know, you shouldn't have to be bribed into being good. And I and to me, I don't think Judaism, to me, I've never thought of Judaism as you know, you know, the God will get you or the God will reward you story because I just didn't think that it related, you know? I don't know what other people think. You know, I think Pam is right. You know, your memory is a blessing and it, and maybe not, you know, after a few generations, you don't get remembered explicitly, but people, you know, my mother used to do this. Your kids will say, oh gosh, that's just what mom did, you know? And that just goes on and on, you know? And your thoughts, your beliefs go on and on. I, I just think the bribery thing is not right. Other comments, Sai? Uh, you know, Marsha, you said you don't think the bribery thing is not right. And yet that's what we've been reading in the Bible for weeks and weeks and weeks that God is threatening to punish the, uh, the Jews, the Hebrews, unless they did certain things. So it was a carrot and stick relationship that they had forever almost. But on this earth, not in the future, not in an afterlife. Well, I don't want to get involved in afterlife. I got enough trouble with this life. But that's what we're talking about is the afterlife. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the whole group here has pretty much categorically rejected the idea of a sentient, sentient, sentient afterlife. I'm back. Ah, Steve's back, just as we're talking about an afterlife. So, Steve, we're talking about whether there is an afterlife, and if so, uh, the, the idea that was presented here was that perhaps okay. that this is a way to understand Appreciate why good people point. suffer in this world. And the answer being that perhaps yeah. God 
will reward them in the afterlife or compensate them in the afterlife. And this could be either good people who are tortured by evil people or good people that suffer terribly from awful diseases, either as children or adults. Um, but people have not been totally convinced. Okay, other comments, Minya, and then Sai, and maybe Steve will stick in a few words. Well, just one thing. The other day at the 9-11 ceremonies, almost everyone who was a reader made a comment about, until I see you again. And I was thinking about that as we're talking about this. Is that, a? I guess that's a purely Christian, well, it's not a purely Christian belief if we're talking about the same thing, that they... We're, you know, kept saying until I see you again, we, you know, we'll be reunited. That's more of a belief that you physically will see each other just as you were. And there's, there's no reason that that's not compatible with certain types of Jewish approaches, but right. uh, not the approach that this group is taking. <laughs> right. But but certainly that's not I wouldn't call that only Christian. You could be Jewish and have that same view, but you wouldn't fit into our group here. <laughs> You're um, right. Who is next? Sai and then maybe Steve. A, a few weeks back on the Parsha, we were reading uh, God has told Moses that he will not be able to enter the land of Israel and he was going to die but that the, the uh, Hebrews were to conquer the land and destroy their enemies. Now that bothers me a little bit because God is making this statement. These people living in Israel, the Canaanites, they hadn't done anything. They were good people. God is sending the Jews to go and kill them to give the Jews the land. Doesn't make sense to me in the reading. How do you, how do you explain that with this? This whole business of God's goodness. Um, Steve has offered to write an explanation of this for next week to explain <laughs> how and why God can say that. And uh, so we're waiting with bated breath to see what Steve can come up with. Um, no, I mean, your comments are very well taken. It may be partially if I don't know if it's any conciliation for you to know that it probably never occurred, that this was all, um, you know, this was all just a, uh, but it was um, something that the writer obviously thought would, would have been a good thing, which maybe make it worse or, or just as bad as if it had actually happened. But I don't think it actually happened. Ray. Uh, well, okay, think of it this way. They are going into the promised land. They know that they're going to have to take uh, land from other people. How else can you think of it? Uh, but they're going into a land that does not know one God. They're going into a land that uh, deals in idols. So uh, according to the Jewish concept, it is all right to go in there and take over because they are the messengers of one God. Is that a good enough concept to forgive us for doing that? I'm not asking that. I'm just saying that maybe that is the whole idea of coming, even, even uh, if you read books that are modern about us coming into the land of Israel in, 19, in the 1940s. The, we were going into Arab lands and buying pieces of land. What we did was take land that had despoiled and become marshland, rather useless. And we have gone in there and made uh, those lands into gardens that uh, uh, give off wonderful oranges and uh, uh, marvel uh, marvelous other things. So are we right to have displaced them? I will not 
I will not try to answer that. Um, uh, Lorraine, there's always a reason. Lorraine or Pam or Babette? Hello? Pam. Um, Rabbi, can we jump to, uh, in the time we have left, can we jump over to your guy, um, Monides? Sure. Uh, that's page 180. Correct. Uh, you want to read part of it or you want to make a comment about my monies? Well, I don't mind reading part of it, but I just thought he said something interesting. So if you want, I'll go ahead and read. In this book, this is page 180. In his book, The Guide for the Perplexed, M Moses Maimonides raises a serious objection to the view that trials and suffering as an opportunity for achieving great reward in Olam Abba. He argues that this is not what Moses had in mind when he declared God's ways are just. Using Job and his loss of wealth, property, and children as an example, Maimonides argues that there's no explanation for the suffering of innocent people. We cannot understand the mysterious and miraculous ways in which God brings the universe to life. We shall not fall into the error of imagining God's knowledge to be similar to ours or God's intention, power, or management comparable to ours. According to Maimonides, if we appreciate, as Job finally did, that God's ways are not always our ways and God's knowledge is not our knowledge, we, we will find suffering more bearable. We will not be filled with doubts about God Instead, our faith will increase our love of God. Mani's view that God's powers of justice and mercy are beyond human understanding is not shared by Jewish mystics. They believe that evil enters the world of creation. Rabbi Isaiah Gloria teaches that God created the world out of a clash between powers, and mercy, powers of mercy and judgment. In that collision, sparks of light and love were lodged into dark shells that make up all the substance of the world. We suffer, Luria maintained because so much is still locked in such shells. The human responsibility is to liberate light, to feel free goodness and healing. God's will is for justice, truth, and mercy. God, dependent upon human beings, is waiting for them to break the dark shells and release God's power for mercy. All right, so here you have a very nice summary, short summary of the, the philo Jewish philosophic tradition and the Jewish mystic tradition in terms of evil. In, in one paragraph here. So Maimonides is a philosopher says, God's ways are unknowable. You're not gonna be able to, 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 um, to think this out clearly. And there's just no, you just have to accept that the, the world is filled with things that are unknowable. The mystics say that there's a whole cosmology and that they, the sparks of goodness are dispersed and a, my a mystical task is to bring them back together and then you can free these sparks of light and bring greater goodness into the world. To, and you can see why the philosophers thought the mystics were kooks and nuts and the mystics thought the philosophers were cold, stone-hearted. So the two groups did not get along, as you might, might imagine. Pam, back to you, comment on this. I like this because I, I think we waste a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> you know about what causes suffering and things. Um, this is an important thing. If you had a child that had some horrible disease or if you yourself or your parents had been persecuted by the Nazis or if you had, you know, even something not so serious, like you've been fired from a job by a mean boss or anything ever. We've all gone through things in life, you know, serious or not that serious, where the uh, capriciousness of life and the, 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 the malevolent uh, spirits of other people or the vagaries of, of luck have not shine, sh shown upon us. And so we, we always, all of us want to know why. Why did we have to endure that? Why did something so bad happen? I mean, this isn't a nat I mean, it's not just Minya that's thinking this, it's all of us, right? Why? 
Now we've all made it to this point, so things could have been worse, but we've all had stuff. So doesn't that question bother you at all, Sam, uh, Pam? Well, I just think sometimes we can't figure out what caused something and there, but I think we have to get past it. Otherwise it consumes us. You know, if you have if you're sick, it consumes you that you can't figure out why did this happen to me? But not having a good answer or not being able to get revenge can consume you even more, right? Right, but I think you, you have to, Mamani is saying, sometimes you just have to get past <laughs> the suffering in the eagle. And that's what, yeah, that's what well, I believe in. So it's easier for, I guess he was a stoic kind of guy and a very cerebral intellectual. And it was not that hard for him to do. And he had his own problems in life, right? He was a full-time scholar and his brother was a rich businessman, supported him. And then suddenly the ship, ship his brother was on sunk in the middle of a business trip and his brother was killed. And then he had to go to work as a doctor and he had to work very hard and he couldn't write books as much. So he had his own challenges and you know, he loved his brother dearly and his brother was supporting him. And then suddenly no more. Marsha. Is there a, and maybe we're talking about it, a Jewish equivalent of karma, what we call karma in our society? Well, we'd have to study Kabbalah and, um, you know, we, we were, we were going to do another course on that and uh, we haven't yet. Uh, but but I, I would you think equate that in there, the karma and Kabbalah? I would think that Kabbalah has something like that, yes. But we'd have to investigate that further. Um, Riva. Can't hear you. I just want to vote with Pam and Maimonides in that some of this is, un certainly these major things are unknowable, but what we do have control about uh, to some degree is how we live our lives and how we choose to focus and get on with our lives. And if you stay focused on why did this happen to me or why did this happen to my beloveds, that's, that's, that will take you down and nowhere. And I think it's important to focus on what you know, how can I live my life? How can I contribute? How can I leave the world a better place? Um, how can I convey to my um, grandchildren uh, the wisdom and beauty of their ancestors? That I can do. And I think that sharing is, is how we carry those blessings on beyond the life of those other people. Steve, any comments at this point? We've given you a few minutes to reacclimate. No comments at this point. Uh, any concluding comments? Um, uh, well, I want to wish everyone a happy new year, of course, and a good fast, an easy fast. And um, unfortunately, I will not be at, at the service in person. I was supposed to, but I'm not feeling well. Best to uh, stay away and, and keep everyone else safe as well. So, um, but. I'm looking forward to tonight's service and tomorrow all day, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, well, have a very, uh, a very meaningful Yom Kippur, and uh, I, I've got my hands full, as you can see, um, and uh, if you're interested, you can sign up for the NOAA course. And I'll see you uh, tonight or tomorrow, one either online or in person. Very good. Also, um, you're going to be asked to register for, for the discuss this Torah discussion. Please do that. And um, because we want to have a complete registration of everybody who's interested in this program, and then we'll be able to very reliably send, send the, um, the papers out each week. Will we Ross send that out? Um, she will be doing that. Yes. A request to register? Yes. Yes. We will be announcing that. Okay. It'll come out in the email? Um, I think it's going to, I'm, I'm not positive. I believe we'll, we'll put it in the bulletin in the chauffeur. Okay. 
it's, we, we have a whole new agenda for next year and it's, it's wonderful. There's so many interesting topics to cover, just like the ones we've seen today and before. Is it the same Wednesday at the yes. same time? Same time, same place. Same time, same place. Also on Zoom. So we also can see Zoom. and hear each other. Um, there, there will be an, a 4 a.m. option, but bet if you prefer. A what option? 4 a.m. Not yeah. in my house. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> well, keep in mind, it, it, uh, we are recording this, so therefore you can watch it at 4.30 a.m. No, I don't do early. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know if you want to conclude. Um, I'm ready. Okay, we have the blessing after Torah yes, study. The blessing are you ready? After. Together, everyone. Baruch Blessed is Adonai, 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 giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. Again, everyone, a happy new year. L'shana Tova. Um, Bernie, Bernie, did you? you and feel better. Bernie, did you have a question or comment? No. Okay. No, we're just waving goodbye. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. See Bye. everyone tonight. Okay. Stay well. Take Good care. Good luck with your test. Thank you.